My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you have received the Spirit, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride, for all must carry their own loads. Thanks, Karen. You got off pretty easy there. We'll bring you back when we do Leviticus here in a couple, <laughs> couple of years. This morning what I want to jump into, and we'll, I'll kind of bring us back to Galatians in just a second, but there's three questions that really emerged for me that I think uh, deserve our attention. They're pretty uncomfortable, uh, and it's this question of, like, is transgression a thing? Is, is sin a thing? Is morality a thing? And I think on some level that one's easier to handle, but these next two are, are at the very least likely to be pretty foreign to you, if not incredibly uncomfortable. And it's these questions of to the extent that there is such a thing, uh, do I need others' help? Do you need others' help? And, and do others need mine? Do others need yours? In other words, is, is this thing called morality and sin and transgression, is it, is it purely individual? Is it all this individual journey? And, and or to what extent is it something that we do together? And Listen, if, if there's any truth to any of it, I hope to make it clear it's not lost on me that this is at best terribly uncomfortable, but also perhaps uh, worth some consideration. And I'll, I'll in just a moment bring us back around to why I think Paul is even bringing this up. Here's how I've been thinking about it, because like every one of us in this room, uh, I'm aware that we live in this socially, politically charged world. And it's more clear to me than ever that we need more places, like I hope Narrate is, that make it safe for people on both sides of all those conversations. But at the same time, the, the conversation that I'm playing out in my head constantly is, is what if someone corners you on this thing or that thing? What if someone asks for your opinion? And, and again, like there's, I mean, we could spend the whole day just listing the different areas where things are so charged right now. Uh, there's the issue of public finance and public funding versus private funding and how it is, how it is we think about tax and, and the poor and things like that. Uh, there's sexuality and so many conversations that impact so many people in such personal ways and just how exactly do we think about that. And here's the way I've been thinking about it and I think Paul has helped me to maybe get inside this a little bit more. You'll get to decide whether or not you think it's helpful for you is like to what extent uh, is it important, and this is the question I'm asking myself, is to what extent is it important that we agree on the specific morality of a specific thing? Like, to what extent is it important that we agree on that which is good and beautiful and true and other-centered? And, and to what extent is it actually even more helpful to first agree that there are boundaries? I mean, that, when, when I play that, those conversations out in my head, I, I think that's primarily what's important to me right now is this like, okay, I think I'm more comfortable if we disagree on the specifics, if we can first of all agree that there is a such thing as sin and transgression, that morality is a real thing, that it does have weight and importance. And, and do you see what I'm saying there? Like, so what, what, if, what if there's more permission to disagree on the specifics if we can at least start from this starting point of there's certain things that a human can do that are all about self and not about others. There's certain things a human can do that, that, are, that are more conducive to, to evil and hurt than, than to that which is good and beautiful and true. There's certain things that are good and there's certain things that are bad. And if we can disagree on the specifics, maybe there's value in agreeing on that general principle. See, here's what Paul's doing to the extent that I understand it in Galatians. And if you're like, how are we here? Okay, so we started the series, what was the third Sunday in January, uh, called it Sticks With You. And some of you are like, oh, I thought that thing was dead. <laughs> it's not. We've got three more weeks, this week, next, and then one more in between there. But I, I was on a ride this last, it was early summer, I was listening to one of my theological heroes, N.T. Wright, and he made the comment somewhat offhanded that he thinks maybe the letter to the Galatians is, is the most important part of the New Testament in this cultural moment. Now that, to me, struck my, it, it grabbed my interest because, quite frankly, I have great respect for him but I didn't have enough familiarity with Galatians to understand why that would be the case, and that's a huge claim from a very reputable person. So I, in my own morning kind of study time, uh, threw myself into just studying Galatians and trying to figure that out, and of course then I pulled in some resources, not the least of which is his commentary, and, and, and we in January, or yeah, in January started this series. And here would be this like 
greatly simplified version of the ground we've covered so far. Because what Paul is doing in Galatians, first of all, Galatians is considered by most the oldest piece of literature in the New Testament. Now, anything 2,000 years can be debated, but, but, and, and we're not talking like the oldest piece of minor literature. There's little creeds and things in the Bible like in Philippians 2 and in 1 Corinthians that are older. But as far as a complete compilation of scripture or of a letter, many see Galatians as the oldest. And the context going on in Galatians is Paul is writing to these people who have, who have experienced Christ. Everything we celebrated last week and, and Easter and death defeated, evil defeated, God's, God's king come to earth, They're trying to live with the implications of that. And the issue was, for Jewish people, for a very long time, there were some really clear things that people did or didn't do if they were part of God's family. And Paul's going, those are all out. Like the only identifier that matters anymore is Christ and him crucified and what you do with him. And that has, it just shook up the world, and and especially local to to the Jewish world and the regions around it. And there was great debate. And what was happening when Paul wrote the letter, to the extent that I understand it, is that you had two groups of people. You had Jewish followers of Jesus, and then you had these Gentile followers of Jesus. And more or less, they had come to an agreement, like, we'll just do two separate churches. We'll do our Jewish Jesus church, and we'll do our Gentile Jesus church, and and that'll be enough. And the implications of this are huge. I'm not even going to begin to get into them this morning, but Paul shows up and goes, "Uh uh-uh, we're not doing that. God has one family It's now found in Christ. We're not doing it that way. In fact, we explored uh, in in the start of the series, if you can picture the kind of classic Christian nativity art, there's oftentimes even sitting in the front yard on on Warren Street or something, there's these, uh, not in my house, but just even in the modern uh, uh, nativity scene, there's often a baby, and then there's like a, a cow and a donkey, or an ox and an ass, and there's like, what, what, what are they doing there? And in the oldest nativity scenes, we know that those were the three most common characters. And even that conveys this idea because one of those animals is clean and one of them is not. And there's this value system that happened in the early church of this baby, who in a lot of art, especially Eastern art, he's not in a manger, he's in a tomb. This baby, the life, death, and resurrection of this baby started a whole new family of God and for God. So that then led to this question, and this is what Paul's getting into in Galatians 6. Okay, so if the law's gone, if the Spirit's here, if all of these kind of qualifiers are out, and that gets us into this next slide, is Jesus' way of being human and anything goes way of living? And you can see how you would get here logically, like, okay, so if the only thing that matters is what we do with Christ, then, then does, does anything go? Because Paul, in the early church, it kind of eliminated a lot of really clear boundaries, and so what do we do? So Paul, in chapter 6, in closing up this letter, this week and especially this week and next week in particular, he's addressing this question of, okay, so what do we do then? Is it just anything goes? And listen to the way he starts. It's, in my mind, very uncomfortable. My friends, if anyone's detected in a transgression, now, we just, I think worth stop, stopping there. Like, what's the observation just from that statement? What are the implications? What are the assumptions being made? Like, does Paul still see some behavior as in the best interest of everybody and others only in the best interest of self? Does he see some things as central to what it means to be human created by God and others detracting from that? Does he see sin? Of course he does. But what happens next, I think, is even more uncomfortable. You who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Now, the ending is nice, like gentle. Okay, that's good to know, because as a parent, that's like the hardest thing to do, is, is, is do discipline gently. But you see what else he just said in there? And this is one of those like you can breeze through it or frankly if you, don't, if, if you don't read the Bible this way and this is somewhat new to me too especially from the teaching standpoint you just skip it. But what massive assumption is he making here? Has something to do with like I'm responsible to help you with your sin and you are with mine? Now at, at best it's really uncomfortable, isn't it? In fact, listen to the way he keeps going because uh, this is even worse I think. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Now, I was in my 20s discipled by a guy who, and just spent a lot of time with a guy. This was quite literally his favorite verse, I think. And he taught me a lot about just serving people, because his, his adage was, 
you know, if there's people around you that, that need something, he always kind of budgeted in such a way that he had extra to help people, and it was often tires for, for single moms and, and meals for people who were in hard times, and he just was generally helpful and generous, and this verse is what drove that way of living, bear one another's burdens. Now, I, I think it really captures the ethos of what it means to follow Jesus. I didn't know until I studied Galatians. I don't think it has anything to do with what Paul's saying here. Like, what's the burden that Paul is suggesting you need to help me carry and I need to help you with. Again, it's transgression, it's sin. Now, sometimes I think it's most, it's, for me, I can't take something seriously until I first just name, like, how are all the ways this goes bad? And many of you know firsthand all the ways this has gone bad. You've been a part of religious cultures where this was abused. You're recovering from it now. You, you're married to somebody. You have friends and family who are these and they wouldn't touch this place and it's frankly because this was applied but not done very well. I've realized in this kind of post-COVID world that one of the great blessings my parents gave me and my family of origin is I'm in this very, very, very small group of people like I genuinely can't think of a time where I've been hurt in God's name like by an authority figure, by a parent, whether that's shame or just misapplication. Like I, I seriously can't think of a single instance. And the more time I've spent with people, the more I realize like I'm in a really small group. And many of you aren't in my group, so to speak. You know firsthand. There's these cliches from some generations about rulers and knuckles and certain kinds of schools. Like it's just, it's, it's everywhere. My, my friend, one, one of my closest friends, Fred, or I guess, mentor friends, he has this statement where he says, nobody thrives in an environment where they're constantly being evaluated. Now, if it's true, which it strikes me as incredibly true, it's almost the opposite of what Paul's saying. Or at least it's, it's when it goes bad, it's, it's what happens. And he's speaking of marriages, like you can't thrive in a marriage if you're constantly evaluating one another. He's talking about work. He's talking about athletes. He, he's, he's talking about all of it. And it, again, it, Makes sense to me. There's, many of you have been in marriages that didn't make it because there was this culture. Some of you, that's what made the first few mar- years of marriage so hard is you had to figure out like this isn't sustainable. We've lost workplace relationships from, from some of this. John Townsend, the great Christian psychologist, I think it was him that I first heard say that relationships work like bank accounts, that if the deposits aren't greater than the withdrawals, it's not sustainable. And in many ways, greatly so. Like, and and so, so how do we hold that intention with what Paul is saying here? And then there's the reality of marriage. Um, the person that I know who has quite genuinely spent more time with people navigating marriage than any person I know and probably any person, I mean, maybe Gottman and a few others, but it's a, it's a huge list. One of his agreements uh, that he asked couples to come to is just to agree you can't be the other person's Holy Spirit which again kind of pushes against what Paul is saying. And what he means by that is his agreement, and this is the way I was taught it, and we've talked about this in the past. Teresa and I, I think are actually, this is one of the things we're pretty good at. His thing is, like if there's something that your spouse is doing that's driving you bonkers, and I suppose there's exceptions, but even, or or to you is sin, the agreement is, God, I'm I'm gonna talk to you about that. And if the problem is, is me, then please make that clear to me. And if the problem is them, then please send a friend because I'm not doing it. Now, are there exceptions? Yes. Should we apply this all the time? Probably not. But again, it speaks into this thing that we all know, don't we? That, that cultures that are overly critical, they just don't work. And yet here comes Paul and he says, hey, you need each other. Now, part of where it makes sense for me, and maybe you can relate to this, is is I can think of instances where people did this for me, but it's like brain surgeon stuff. Like it's, it, it, it's a card you don't get to play in a relationship very often. You have, to, you have to wield that thing like a scalpel. But I think it does lead to this question of, are you open to the idea that sometimes God's gonna ask people in your life to, to challenge you on things? And, and is there evidence from your recent history that that you'll receive that when it occurs. Now, Paul keeps going, and this is both beautiful and frustrating. We're gonna skip verse three, where basically Paul speaks to this, the danger of getting arrogant in all of this. 
a culture of humility. But then listen to verse four. All must test their own work, then that work rather than their neighbor's work will become a cause for pride. Uh, For all must carry their own loads. It's like, okay, Paul, I think you just spoke out of both sides of your mouth. (laughs) Right? I mean, on the one hand, he's saying, hey, carry each other's loads. On the other hand, he goes, hey, you carry your own loads. What's he saying here? This is where, in my opinion, uh, truth best shows up in paradox. And, And I think we're a part of an ancient faith that can be celebrated for its use of paradox, though sometimes we stray from that. Because on the one hand, he's saying, you need each other. There's somebody God calls you to be in the world and you need each other to stay there. And on the other hand, he goes, hey, but let me just remind you, uh, you you'll be judged alone. This, which is his own paradox. Like, the whole faith thing is done in community and yet Paul's saying, but when it comes to judgment, it's just you. Here's how, I, for me, this has been a helpful way of trying to reconcile this. Think about the up-and-coming business person or student or person on your team that you just hired or let's just use an athletic metaphor. metaphor. You know, in a couple weeks, there's the NFL draft and there will be these phenomenal athletes drafted by a team. And what we know is if you're drafted into the first round or any round of the NFL draft, you've got some incredible skill. You've got a history of work ethic, probably. But there's, there, there's, a, there's a paradoxical truth in whether or not your future ever becomes one of success in the NFL, isn't there? Because on the one hand, we know that for an athlete to achieve the, the top of their potential, it's going to require coaches and trainers who are like those brain surgeons, who can give critical feedback at times, who can push you further than you would ever push yourself, who can like manage the throttle of pushing you but not breaking you, challenging you but not destroying you. You're going to need outside people. And yet, don't we also know that that by itself won't get the job done? Like You're going to have to have a hunger inside of you, or they are, There's going to have to be an internal drive that also, independent of a coach or a trainer, is is itself is motivated to move in a certain direction. And I wonder if Paul's okay with the tension of that. That that we 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 step into life with Christ in this Easter tide season of celebration, knowing that God is trying to pull us into these more full versions of ourselves for ourselves and for others. And yet at the same time, we're going to need people who help us, and we've got to want it. I, I realized <clears throat> here a little bit ago, it's probably been a few months, that like, I'm really guilty. I think it was some of the stuff that we did that I prepared for with Ash Wednesday because Ash Wednesday is such a focus on, and Lent as a whole, of just like I'm accountable to God and trying to honor that. And I realized, even though Jesus says, hey, when you pray, Pray things like, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And what I realized is, like, I acknowledge the cross as a function of forgiveness in my life, but I'm pretty guilty of of not, like, living in that space of, like, okay, God, what are you refining in me? What do I need to confess to you? And one of the tools that's become really helpful to me in that is, quite frankly, the, the, the Book of Common Prayer and where it's helped me in the, especially the early pieces is, like, I'm really faithful at showing up in the morning, studying my Bible, doing that thing, but it's almost like I, I, I don't, there's, th- there's no hello to God and there's definitely oftentimes not a penitent beginning but just this like kind of entitled thing and there's a particular prayer. I don't use all of uh, this, but we have it on the screen. I have it on an app here and I just wanted to read it from here. So I'd say probably four, four days a week right now I'm starting with this prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts and we've offended against your holy laws. We've left undone those things which we ought to have done and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there's no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name, amen. And the way I was trained was then, having prayed that, read that, I'm I'm by myself, I'm not even saying it out loud, just starting from this place of silence and just creating space, like, God, is there something you need to talk to me about? Is there a moment yesterday that needs brought up? Is, is, there, is there a 
habitual sin that you want to talk to me about? I mean, I know there's a bunch of them there, but is there one you want to make me conscious of right now? I think that's what Paul's getting at here. Is he, far more than I ever could, understands what God is doing. That God has taken this temple and it's soon to no longer be, but this temple is now going to be in these people. And that whole thing requires a people who don't just know the facts about his death and resurrection, but are being formed into his image. And that that's going to take a real internal fortitude, a real commitment of like, Lord, this isn't about being religiously arrogant or self-righteous or even about just like feeling bad about myself so that I can feel good about myself religiously. This is about there's someone you need me to be. That what I get out of this life is who I become. What those that I love gets out of my, get out of my life is who I become. And what you get out of my life is who I become. And somehow staying open to, there's, there's for sure a couple major ways that God is going to do that. So listen, there's, for me in getting ready for this week, there's just so much trepidation uh, from all of this that, the way I found myself thinking about how do we end this was I would just, in my office, kind of instinctively, I would end by just kind of, there were certain things I was praying over us. And that's the way I want to end here because it was something like, and certainly there's some of us here who God's been nudging you uh, to nudge someone else. And that takes incredible courage and precision. And there's others of you who maybe even recently, you, someone's nudged you, someone's challenged you Maybe even it's just frankly been the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's this internal thing where you've just had this like, I gotta deal with this, I gotta deal with this. I guess my prayer for you and for us this morning is that somehow we would see that we're invited to live in this tension of Easter. That on the one hand, it's been dealt with. God's forgiveness is final. And on the other hand, there's so much that lies ahead that God wants to rescue and free you from for the sake of others. So we're going to take communion, and I think it's, I'd like to think it's kind of a perfect morning to do that. Part of this tradition is just creating time to just go, God, what do you want to talk to me about? And use that time of preparation to confess that. It's also a time, and I think this is important, is that you hear not just, God, what do you want to talk to me about, but that you would just know, like, you're forgiven. You confess it's forgiven. And then also to just sit with, I'm still trying to make sense of sacramental theology myself, but part of what's starting to make sense is, like, I experience God so easily in my mind, uh, less so emotionally, but I'm even better at that than other things, but part of the value of the bread and the wine is uh, a God who says, there's going to be a physical resurrection, and it would make sense that this God would want us to experience his presence in the material world, in, in bread and wine, and so if you've not done this, we'll loop to the front, and then uh, Hannah's going to come lead us through it. But it really, here I think is the prayer. God, would you take my life? Uh, would you send your spirit into me? Would you send me into the world for, for your sake and others? And then God, would you take this bread and this wine and would you send your spirit into it that I would know your presence and that you would feed uh, this life with you? So let me pray. The band's going to come up here. God, Lord, we get that, that sin is serious. We get that culturally we're struggling with these conversations. I, I personally am, am so grateful to be a part of a place where we don't have to agree on everything, but Lord, would you continue to refine us in the way we think about the reality of, man, there's things that are helpful and things that are destructive. And would you take seriously that it's that very truth that, that made the cross essential, that that we need freed from evil, freed from our own brokenness. So my prayer, Lord, in the, the days, the weeks, the months, the years that follow would be that you would continue, not just in this community, but in communities all over Helena, uh, build us into who you call us to be. Uh, we love you. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us online at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook or Instagram.